So it is your home, it is our home. Mm -hmm. And what we do in this home is have unplugged, real conversations. We say it like it is. Authenticity is what it's all about. We know plenty of people. Um, that can fake it, but you can only fake it consistently for so long. Um, and so if you really want to live in truth, um, be who you are, own your own strengths, and as Oscar Wilde said, be yourself because everyone else is taken. And so here I'm just so thrilled to have two remarkable, amazing, inspiring women to share um, their stories in an unplugged, real, authentic way. So please welcome Wenda Millard and Martha Stork. So thank you uh, so much for, for coming. Once again, Martha uh, sells out the house. Um, this is our fourth in a series of what we've come to call Les Jeunes uh, here at Cannes. And I had the privilege of uh, interviewing Gloria Steinem, having a, a great chat with her, uh, with Mary Wells Lawrence, with Charlotte Beers, who's here with us today, and now the one and only Martha Stewart. Um, so we are, I hope, going to get a little unplugged in a few minutes and uh, as Shelly said it is it is one of the only places uh, where we can really really tell it like it is it it is off the record um, but Martha let's just start by uh, you know couple couple of sort of I guess classic questions to you um, you you and I have have worked together for many many years in various capacities and the one thing I think if I had to choose one thing that I believe about you is that you have a unique, extraordinary level of curiosity. And I think that that defines you in so many, many ways. Is that, is that close to how you would think of yourself and, and your sort of top characteristics? Well, when people ask, you know, to describe yourself in a couple of words, curious is always one of them. Um, and uh, and I'm happy being curious because it's the one way that um, that as you uh, grow older you can continue to learn. Uh, and I always feel that um, that a teacher and I consider myself a teacher first and foremost. A teacher must be curious and must learn to be able to teach. And it's an ongoing thing with me: learning, teaching, learning, teaching. And uh, and we, um, I and, and everybody who works with me, um, really want to do um, intense research before we sort of write about it or photograph it. Or so we're we're very um, very strict about our, our research, and that is learning. And my motto, uh, one of them, I have I have several mottos, but uh, one is learn something new every day. Well, Martha, could you talk? I want, I want to talk about that research you do. It's a little different from how other people do it. And I am thinking uh, specifically of a time uh, up at your extraordinary home in Maine um, that you volunteered all of us to get up at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> and believe me, she was ready and tapping her foot. Um, she'd been calling up some way early. Was I early. on the intercom? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about the intercoms. But um, we went that morning, among other places, to the public farmer's market uh, up in Maine. And I think of that as a venue for your research. So can you talk about how you go right out into the public and have these conversations with what I would call everyday families in, in the United States. Well, it's true. Um, I, I learn a lot by, by example. Uh, when I wanted to learn how to make sushi, I went to Nobu and I begged him to let me uh, watch him really intensely. I was one of his first American friends. Uh, when he came to New York and opened his restaurant downtown on, um, on um, uh, what was the name of that street where Alexis lived? Franklin. Lay? Yeah, Franklin. Um, way downtown in Tribeca. Um, and I just watched him. And uh, after about five years, we went to Japan together. And we uh, traveled through the Skiji fish market. He took me to all his favorite places. He made sure I got the right knives. Uh, and then another couple years after that, he let me work behind the sushi bar at Nobu 57. <laughs> Wait, now, were you trying to be incognito or? No, or? no, not at all. <laughs> but he let, me, he let me go behind the bar and he gave me my own Nobu jacket with my name embroidered on it. 
and uh, and that's a pretty big deal because in truth uh, to become a sushi chef at Nobu you have to work at least 10 years you know cutting sushi before you're you're made you're allowed to stand behind so I made it a few years earlier than that but what fun and that's the way I learn I, I have I've never taken a formal cooking lesson um, so in a class I've never gone to a cooking school I wish I had but uh, but I've never had the time now, now you teach it I mean yeah, I do I teach it every book. every week I have yeah. two big lessons on PBS and then and other places but um, but I have learned a lot by example by watching by by studying by uh, I watch people's hands I watch the way they do things and I've been so lucky in my television to be able to call in chefs from all over the world to work with me and I learn their techniques and their secrets and their and their methods and uh, and I've learned a lot well you know you you obviously have have celebrity access but I, I remember another particular time uh, when we were down in the Bahamas at Susan Magrino's wedding and uh, you were seated here I was seated here and I saw you get up and you spent 20 20 minutes talking to this woman and when when you came back I said oh who who was that you said I have no idea and I was like wow 20 minutes when, when you meet a, a stranger, what what do you talk about? What are you asking them? Well, I don't I don't remember that, but um, <laughs> but I'm sure I learned something. Uh, I, I rarely talk to anybody without learning something, and uh, and and it's the it's just uh, it's just natural for me to question and to to investigate and um, and I, I do it all the time. I mean, it's just it's just and another thing I don't do is drive down the same street more than once or twice if I could possibly go another way. And my driver, he, they, I drive. I have a couple drivers. They drive. I drive them crazy because they like to go, you know, Twenty Third Street. I don't like to go on Twenty Third Street. I don't learn anything on Twenty Third Street. Uh, and the other day, I was driving on Thirty uh, Eighth Street. Uh, similar. I was going someplace similar, um, but I found a shop that's full of wheels. It's a wheel shop, and so and close and, and casters and things for furniture. Uh, and now I know, now I know where to get all the casters. I know I can do a story on it. I'm going to do a story on it in the magazine because how fascinating! I did not know this particular store existed. And he said they have something like twelve thousand different kinds of wheels and casters in this store. So sure that's fascinating. <laughs> well, it Charlotte, is. if you couldn't hear in the back, Charlotte said, "Are you sure that's fascinating?" No, it is. I spent a long time in there I was late for my appointment. Because um, because I have missing wheels on, on old vintage office chairs and uh, and on uh, some pieces of furniture and you have to know those you have to know this stuff but, but not on your car I mean I hope you no no no, no okay I'm just, I'm just checking I'm just checking well you know I was just thinking about um, you know when when you're sort of in that everyday everyday mode have you have you ever gotten jealous of your french bulldogs because honestly martha <laughs> they're really kind of as famous as you are like how do you feel about that oh i, I want them to be even more famous because it helps with the business uh, the more people that know i have french bulldogs and and actually francesca and sharky the, there's there's a brindle and a cream uh they become a kind of mascots for um for our uh, pet smart business uh, which is evolving into something else, which I'm th not going to talk about, but uh, but it's so interesting to to know that people and and pairs of similar bulldogs have appeared all over New York. I think single-handedly, or or double-handedly, Francesca and Charky have been very important in increasing the bulldog population of New York City uh, because they're so cute and they, they have and they, they do are cute. Cute. They are. Yeah. Well, I think you know when when um, you started the blog. Um, with the dogs. I mean, you, you have never seen uh, unique user acceleration uh, at that pace. The I mean, daily they, wag. They, the daily wag. I mean, it was just absolutely fantastic. Um, they like getting dressed up. They like posing. I, I like them in their Halloween costumes. Yeah, they like doing all of that. They, they really are very... Um, Sharky's passed away, but I got another pair. The same, same, same colors. Uh, and creme brulee and bete noir mm -hmm. and, and francesca is still around and they're, they're all friends <laughs> I, I remember um since since we are un, unplugged um i remember a, a time when when you were extraordinarily nonplussed about these dogs 
and we were having a client dinner uh, at your extraordinarily beautiful home in Bedford, and we had, uh, you know, a couple clients, as, as you do, who had been a little tough to come along. I remember one uh, was a big bank, and we were seated at dinner, and the dogs, of course, as they always are, uh, were seated under the table, and one of these guys from a bank, um, it's sort of a guy who's very impressed with himself, and he and he had on cashmere socks, and I don't remember if it was Francesco or or if it was Sharky, but do you remember one of the dogs peed all over those cashmere socks? Do you yeah, remember yeah, this? That, I think it was um, I think it was Sharky and um, peed all over. We we quietly took his socks and had them washed and dried. Exactly completely nonplussed, as if this happened every now, night. Now, the reason he got to the socks is because I don't allow shoes in my house. At, at that time, there was no shoe no shoe policy, and even clients had to I take their shoes off. I remember, because at five foot two, that has a lot of meaning to me. <laughs> <laughs> but now now, I, now the rows are dirty, and not, you know, you can't, you, and you live on a farm, you, you have to sort of loosen your, loosen your uh, grip. So, um, but I, 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 I like to live like the Japanese. Japanese would never think of wearing shoes on the house. So we gave socks out, but we forgot to give that. That there guy had already had socks on, so he didn't put on those, the other socks. And so he got peed on. But, <laughs> but, um, but that's not as bad as the, as the pair of socks that got eaten with holes in it. You have to tell everybody about yeah, that. Yeah, similar kind of thing. The guy was the guy took his socks off to put the other socks on and the somebody one of the cats I think ate his cashmere socks. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, all in a day's journey. Um, I, I do want to get back to something um, that you said about every day you were looking to learn something new and of of all the parts of the business that you built and the so many journeys that you've been on. What do you consider untackled territory for you now? Well, um, the, my dream, and I've had this dream for a long time, I presented it 25 years ago to Kleiner Perkins, to, um, to John Doerr, remember? And um, and it's uh, and I it was just the beginning of, of people doing um, it wasn't even apps at that time it was all it was all called software at that time not apps um, and I, I said look John I really want to do the organizer for the homemaker um, and and he they listened the whole the whole executive team came in and listened to me present and they said they were shaking their heads and this is in the day i mean intuit existed in those days there were very complicated companies amazon was on its way google was just starting and uh and i said it's it's a possible thing to do you can do this and they all said no not not now at least it's way too complex so now i'm working on that again 25 years later and i that'll be my i think my big earthworks if you want to call it an earthworks I'll let you know one of the other ideas that you had that that I actually I really loved and wish we had been able to do it um, was Marthapedia. Do you remember that one? Oh, yeah. And tell tell everybody about that. I thought it was brilliant. We've about we about done Marthapedia in terms of uh, our content library. We have a very large content library, and which is being uh, mined uh, re regularly now. We have just. Uh, 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 licensed our magazines to Meredith, and Meredith is using uh, much of our content uh, very well on their social social platforms and uh, and if, and for the Martha Stewart website. Uh, so we've been doing a, a lot with the content, and I think it's uh, going to become only more and more and more valuable. The better the content is, the more valuable it is, and the more trustworthy it is. Uh, the the recipes have now become extremely valuable because we've just um, uh, done a partnership with Marley Spoon. It's called Martha and Marley Spoon, which is a food kit delivery service, and we have about 18 or 19,000 uh, trusted and true recipes that some of which have been published. About I think about 13,000 have been published, and the rest not published, uh, used on TV and other things. And those can be applied to this food surface very nicely because we need need a vast library of good recipes uh, without and without the development costs to um, to make the meal kits out of uh, because they get eaten up if you have 365 days in the year and you're going to offer meal kits and original ones um, at least every uh, few months all original uh, that's a lot of recipes over a period of short time so we have 
and uh, and that's so exciting to be able to use those recipes in a new and different way. Well, I think you know one one of the truisms I think of of uh, Martha Stewart Omnimedia is that you brilliantly built a business on a lot of evergreen content, things that will never ever um, go away. But at the same time, you've always invented the new. And yeah. economically, that it's it's a brilliant, brilliant move. Well, it's I've always said evergreen content is good, um, but if there's a bit, I, you know, we showed the way to plant a tree, and we showed it in the magazine, we showed it on television, we showed it in books. Not always repetitive; it's different, different people doing it, or different, uh, but always the same technique. But if perchance there's a better way to plant a tree, we will remedy that and do it again. But we don't have to repeat what we've already done, and we don't we don't repeat very often. I mean, the 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 whole premise of the magazine Living is that it's a limitless subject matter, and uh, and you don't have to repeat very often uh, because you always have a the next creative mind helping you uh, determine a new way to celebrate Fourth of July or Christmas or make a new wreath. You you have to tell the story. I, I, this may be a very new story to this audience, but um, tell the story of. Of, uh, when you were talking initially to Time Inc. Oh, right. <laughs> this is a great one. Well, when, when I was trying to persuade Time to publish the magazine, uh, I had a prototype already that had been uh, developed and paid for by um, Cy Newhouse at Condé Nast. He had given me the money and two people to work with me on a prototype, and then he he liked it, but he didn't want it to be called anything but Condé Nast, and I wanted it to be Martha Stewart. And so he gave me the prototype, and I went off my, merrily looking for for another backer. And um, I showed it to the to the honchos at Time, and they looked at the magazine and said, oh, this is a fabulous July magazine, but what will you do next July? It's all here. You, there's, and I said, excuse me? I said, this is just one July. We have, you know, so many. It's, it's. They didn't get the limitless thing, and um, and uh, and indeed, we have never, never done the same thing twice on Jul for a July issue. So or any issue. Yeah. I mean, the the the, the uh, blueberry and raspberry and whipped cream cake looks different. The desserts have always been different year after year after year, and the decorations have always been different. So you can, and we know that we can. So. You know, one of the things that I, I, again, marvel at is how you began to use technology very early on. Um, and I think it was, uh, you and I, I think, got our very first Kindles, I think among the first that were ever oh, made yeah. by John Doerr. Right. Um, Martha looked at hers and immediately became the ambassador for uh, the Kindle. I was still turning mine over, trying to figure out <laughs> what it was about. But talk about how technology has really facilitated um, the growth of the company but also your ability to communicate uh, with new audiences. Well, when we started the magazine, and Martha Stewart Living, by the way, is 25 years old this year. Yay. Yes. And we just celebrated. We have a beautiful uh, 25th anniversary issue out, showing all the covers of the, uh, or our favorite covers from the last 25 years, and um, and those first issues uh, 25 years ago were designed on an Apple computer. We used uh, Apple um, exclusively. We did not. We had no cut and pasting. All the other magazines were still on the table with layouts, manual layouts, and we uh, adopted technology. And that was one of my my uh, initiatives was to not not use uh, the old-fashioned methods to, con to constantly keep up with technology. We were the first uh, magazine to create a lifestyle digital magazine with uh, beautiful uh, digital features, with uh, movie with video and and um, and uh, time lapse photography. And it was called Boundless Beauty, and that we were the first. And uh, working with Adobe, remember. Uh, and all the extraordinary uh, uh, digital features. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, sometimes technology is uh, doesn't pay off because the digital issues haven't paid off yet. Uh, not in not in lifestyle magazines. Uh, and we thought the first the first year. Uh, 
that 4.9% of our readers adopted the digital, and we thought, oh, the next year it will be 10. That was the that was the big number, 10% the second year. Well, it was like 4.9% the second year. And then the third year went up a little tiny bit, but it was not uh, it was not um, extreme enough uh, to increase the use of all these other you know bells and whistles for a digital issue. So we've gone mo more to just a straight PDF digital, and uh, and that doesn't make me happy because I like to be innovative. But uh, you have to also work with the with the funds at hand. So um, so sometime it will it will change. I know it will, but. But right now we're still lucky that the paper, the paper and the issues, the printed issues, are still um, as popular as they all have been. So you have built a career uh, of first and a, and a, a career on, on risk taking. Um, I don't remember you ever really talking about the kinds of risks that you took that you look back on now and say, wow, I can't believe I did that. What do you think was the biggest risk that you ever, ever took? Well, I, I'm, I'm pretty, um, I never look back and say, wow. Um, I always say, I don't even think about it. I mean, I signed a, a personal loan for $45 million when I bought my magazine back from Time. They were, we were 50-50 partners and they had, they had in a silly way, written on a piece of paper because when we when we signed with them we said well you know if we want it back and it doesn't work out how much and they wrote down 45 million on a little scrap of paper which i kept and uh they had signed it's not a, even not even official and um and they that's what i paid them but i signed for it myself my bankers are you crazy but uh but i kept ownership that way which was good yeah crazy like a fox yeah crazy <laughs> like a fox exactly but uh but it's um it's just being i think i'm an entrepreneur and i live and breathe like an entrepreneur so risk taking and calculated risk taking is is a feature of an entrepreneur um, it's not being careless or being crazy. It's it's being a calculated risk, and and that's uh, that pays off sometimes. Well, <laughs> touche. What do you do for fun? Um, well, I plant trees. That's one thing I do. I garden. Um, my life changed five years ago drastically um, when my daughter had. Uh, two grandchildren, um, not, and not at the same no, time. No, five, and then uh, less than a year later, she had a, 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 the second one, and it made me a, a, like a sop for children, just a sop. And uh, my friends, I'm sure, are just fed up hearing about the kids, seeing pictures, and blah blah blah. But uh, but it had really um, actually developed a whole new interest for me in terms of uh, how to educate, how to treat, how to feed, how to. Uh, care for uh, young children and educate them, and uh, and it's um, it's an amazing uh, opportunity for another business too to to really and I'm well, I don't want to do it I want my daughter to do it and she's working on it now and I think that'll be a very fascinating business at one point or another. One of the things that people don't know, um, I think, very well about you, is you are really funny. Oh, good. You are really funny. I'm going to tell a quick one, and then I want you to think about um, times that you've been funny. But one time, um, we were we were in Detroit, and only Martha Stewart would do this. But her amazing home uh, in Maine was the estate of uh, Henry uh, Clay Ford. Uh, no, Edsel. Edsel. It was Ford Edsel. and um, Henry's son. And, and his wife, and this was is really an extraordinary piece of property that, like many, um, had been kind of let go a little bit. It had some of the most beautiful, beautiful uh, gardens and landscaping. Martha painstakingly researched um, all of the, the heritage of all of those plantings and found them all over the country, rebuilt this extraordinary uh, estate. And so we were in Detroit one time to visit the Ford family uh, and show them, you know, the care that you had taken and uh, preserving um, their property. Um, and it was a wonderful day, but when we went back to the plane, um, we had some, some challenges, and so we had uh, an hour to kill. And Martha said, let's go. Uh, to, was it Kmart or, no, it was Target. Let's go to Target. 
and so we arrived at the at this target um and martha you know grabbed a a basket and uh we were going through the the front and this really large man was at the at the front of the door and he looked and he he was so stunned that it was Martha Stewart and and he and he looked at her and he said do you know that you look exactly like Martha Stewart and you looked at him and you said no I can't stand her and what the guy was like left like absolutely unbelievable you can throw people in in so many ways but you are really funny how come you're not funnier off, more often well I, I had to save it up for Justin Bieber and people like that. oh exactly and uh and you were way like, funnier than the rest of the guys then, by the oh, way. Oh, well, we worked very hard. Susan Magrino, my, my, my publicist, she helped me with, a, with that, those jokes that the team was writing, and it was very hard. We worked on it for like a month on that roast, and I had never watched a Comedy Central roast, so I had no idea what I was in for. I did not know I was going to be served as much as I was going to serve, and uh, more, more painful, horrible stuff, and I had no idea what I was getting in for. And my daughter said, have you watched one of those, Mother? And I, and I lied, and I said yes, and of course I hadn't, and it was the same as when I went on Celebrity Jeopardy. I didn't even know how to play Celebrity Jeopardy. I, I had never watched it. And I had to go on. And I won, though, because I'm smart. But um, <laughs> but um, that roast was the best thing. My my company was so against me going out there and doing that. Everybody said, "Are you crazy? This is gonna, your your partner's Home Depot is going to hate it." And Macy's, oh my God, you've had enough trouble with Macy's. And um, <laughs> and I I did it anyway. And it turned out, I think it's three billion impressions later. Billion, um, we're all laughing. We're laughing because it was funny. Charlotte, you have known Martha and been great friends for for many many years. What's funny about Martha? They their their total estimate of who Martha was shifted dramatically. And the reason I think she was so funny is she said all these heart stopping vulgar complex digs as though she were presenting a recipe for chicken and in her measured and she's been on camera the same way since the day I ever met her one time she brought it I was her I kind of lived in her guest house when I was she took pity on me because I lived in the Waldorf and I didn't have any place to go so she said come out here you can stay there don't come into the house very often and and you do take your shoes off. Oh, no. Yeah, I don't think we got in the shoe thing. Yet. But anyway, um, she said, this is amazing thing about her. She, she said, look, I just did this video thing. Now, this is very early. The only thing she has out is the magazine. I mean, I think it was on the, mag the magazine it started. No success in sight in that way. And she did this video rough cut to show the TV people and I actually remember that one section was on composting which I will never understand and the second one was on making a cherry pie which I can tell you she can do in eight minutes and the third one was something about trees and I said but Martha do you think anybody's going to believe you oh no it's spackling what do you call that spackling spackling plastering spackling. And um, I said, do you think anyone will believe one person can do all this? And she said, of course. And she showed this video, and these guys went bonkers. That's how she got. And to me, that, that is both. The reason she's funny is she's never seen anything she couldn't do. The rest of us are astounded. And so there's an element of surprise in that capacity. The difficulty is, because she can do all that, the rest of us are racing just to try to define it and keep up. And her people were like that. But I think people, I think, you know, in the beginning, everybody made fun of me because, you know, I could do all these things and they didn't believe it. But now they've gotten used to it. So, and, and that's why I think um, that I think my TV career has lasted so long. I mean, we're doing two programs on PBS, which when we started, um, I, I ended my daily show um, and it was, 
it was um, a very popular show, not not a great huge audience, but a very popular show, and it's missed by many people. Uh, my Twitter, my Twitter followers always are asking, when am I going to do that show again? Three, three million plus, I think, yeah. right? Yeah, and they are asking all the time. But PBS, with the success of Downton Abbey, has their audience has become tremendously enlivened, and it's an audience that's extremely intelligent, extreme, and wealthy and uh, ed educated, and they love my bake show, and they love my cooking show. We're in the seventh season of both now, and the viewership just for bakes is 1.4 million uh, first showing every week, and then many more uh, on the Create channel and the uh, and the other and the reruns on uh, on digital and both and on uh, PBS. But that's a big audience. Food Network doesn't get that many keep viewers for their shows, and so it's sort of paying off. My my belief in the intelligence of our of our customer, our user, our viewer, uh, is paying off. It's I, I I believed in them, and they are. Responding. So, the truth of the matter is that you created the what we call lifestyle category in in media. Um, you have many many imitators, emulators, emulators. Way better. Is it flattery? Where does it go? Who do you admire? Well, my mom always told me, and my mother gave the best advice. Uh, Imitation is the highest form of flattery. And uh, because I would sometimes complain, oh, so-and-so's making the same dress that I'm making, you know, we're all sewers. Um, and she said, don't worry about it. You know, you, you'll always look better. She always put that in. You'll always look better. So you, you felt you got confidence that, that your, yours was good. And, uh, and so I've, I've always thought that way. And, and, the, uh, and the emulators, there's, of course there's going to be another lifestyle expert out there. Of course, the world is huge. And I've met, I've met the beautiful woman in China that's similar. And uh, just an extraordinary person who probably can't spackle. I, I bet she can't spackle. But, um, but she's, can, she can do a lot of other things. And, and so there's going to be emulators and imitators. And, and some will stick and some won't. Doesn't frighten me. It's a, I'm not sure I know much that does. No, not much. You want to share anything that frightens you? Anything that frightens me. Um, no. I'm not you sure. sure? <laughs> yeah. I've never seen it. Uh, we have a question over here. Hi, Martha. Hi. Um, I'm curious how you translate your English. You know, let, let me give you this so that, yeah. You're getting sunburned. I know, I know. It was worth it was worth sitting in the sun listening to you. Um, I'm just curious how you translate your incredibly high standards into your leadership style, and how you motivate the people that work for you without sort of demoralizing them if they can't live up to your standards. Um, well, most of them do live up to the standards, and, and that's why they're there. And we have people. I have um, employees that have become extremely close friends who have worked with me for 20 years, 23 years, 25 years, and um, and I, I hope I can work with them forever. As long as I'm working, I hope they'll be working. So um, I, I think if you if you're working with people who are like-minded and similarly talented, especially in that's my kind of business. That's a it's a creative business. Um, you um, can uh, have a, a very nice relationship with them. Uh, where it breaks down is where people are not like-minded, um, and and if it's you know if it, it all depends, but uh, but it's um, but that's where that's where you have problems. And also sometimes bringing in someone who is uh, in the in the in the mix that just is so different that can't fit in and and can't deal with uh, what's going on. In, a, in an appropriate fashion. That's where I lose patience. You know, and I think one, one thing that's absolutely true is those folks who've worked with you for 25 years and all that, that I, I can assure you that there will be another 25 years uh, at least to work with Martha because I remember one time you were out in the morning, you'd been at the doctor, and you came back and you came into my office and you said, I have wonderful news. And I said, oh, you know, what's that? Sort of like that. And um, 
you said I've just you know come back from Dr. So and so and I am going to be living until I am 111. And I remember looking at you saying and I am going to shoot myself. <laughs> laughing and that was fun so there's lots and lots of years ahead yeah. um well i'm, work, work I'm working on longevity um also we have a center for living at mount sinai hospital uh which is the martha stewart center for uh for um for um Martha Stewart Center for Living, it's called, not dying for living, and um, and it's a geriatric outpatient ward. You have to be 65 years of age or older to uh, to make an appointment there. But we now have uh, almost 5,000 outpatients in the in the hospital, uh, run by the uh, best geriatricians uh, anywhere. And uh, and Mount Sinai was uh, the first hospital to have a geriatric practice. Started way back in the 1916, 17, something like that. And um, and we are finding out amazing things in this hospital. We we guide uh, the patients uh, with their medical records, the consolidation of all their medical records. Older people get confused about their medications, and they start to duplicate or or uh, take 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 medicines that don't agree with one another one another. Uh, we also give them um, exercise, diet, uh, financial, all kinds of advice. But what is very exciting is the new um, home care that we are establishing for, um, for p patients who are actually ill and have to stay at home. They would be hospitalized generally, but we are keeping them at home and sending doctors to the home. And they get better faster, they're happier, uh, they're more mentally alert. Uh, it's really working very nicely. The other thing is when they're in their <coughs> own environment, obviously that's best, but I, I know that being in the center, one of the things that struck me is it didn't feel like a hospital or a doctor. It's it's a beautiful environment. Oh, it is. Well, I am Pei, uh, his, his architectural firm, uh, we hired him to, um, to um, design the place. And it is very nice. The chairs, if you're small, you can sit on a lower chair and can rise up to be uh, for your examination. It's motorized. It's very, very terrific hospital. Yeah. I just have one question. Wenda has taught me how to plan in advance. Can I book my appointment at that center for 20 years from now? When you're 65? Exactly. Yes. Yes. Definitely. I'm just trying to plan I'll in advance. I'll put you at the top of the list. Thank you. Okay. I, know, I know guys who wrote a song about that when I'm 65. I want to add Martha one thing, which is I have read every magazine and I look at every recipe. But you've never cooked any of them, Shelly. I can't cook cake out of a pie pan, but I still love all the recipes. So a girlfriend of mine gave me the other day a little sign that said, the only reason she has a kitchen is because it came with the house. So I'm really sorry about that, that I'm not one of those, you know, um, homemakers. However, you could teach us so many things, especially, you know, we move so fast, we do so much. We would love for you one day to teach all of us to make some simple recipes. Could do. So how about that? Well, next year we can have a cooking lesson, a cooking oh, class here. Best. You want to do that? Okay. Done. Okay. So I have a question about the opposite spectrum. You know, looking at millennials, um, I'm proud to say I'm 48. I'm a full-time executive. I still cook. I still clean. I sew. I do all these things. I make all of my Christmas gifts for my employees. Um, I make my own sauce. All these things. And all the young women in my agencies are like, I don't cook. I don't have time to craft, but they love the artisanal point of view. How are you going to infuse that energy in that young generation and get them to carry on these amazing traditions of creativity, which I believe, to your point, is what keeps us young every day, you know, this idea of learning and growing our skills so that we're consistently relevant in this industry. So I'd like to hear about what it is that you're doing for this next generation. Well, um, one thing that we've been doing is, is really in incorporating into our magazines, our books. We've done 87 books on basically do-it-yourself. Uh, craft books, wedding books, cookbooks, uh, gardening books, and 87, we're coming up with our 88th book, a, young, a cookbook for young marrieds, a fabulous book. Um, and and really, I think I think it's starting to pay off in terms of the millennials. I think that uh, they really do want to learn, but I think they've been very confused by the infusion of social media. That social media has really taken their eyeballs off what's going on around them. 
uh, and around them what I mean, in the home, in the garden, uh, in, a, in building a home and building a life, they're, they're, just, they're just confused about it and how important it is. Everybody's saying how important it is to be you know, socially uh, active on the internet and, and you have to have Pinterest and you have to have Snapchat and you have to have this and you have to have that. It's too much, really. And they're forgetting that they could actually get some enjoyment out of something else. And uh, so I hope, and I hope once they have children, these millennials that we're, t we're talking about, I hope once they do have a family, they will have been able to absorb or at least know how to learn about other things. Um, and Pinterest is, you know, that's probably the most valuable tool they can have because they're actually doing some research while they're looking at stuff and pinning stuff for maybe the future, maybe, maybe you know, they're, they're, they're accumulating ideas. But, um, but I, think, I think they have to do that. So Martha, I think you know one of the things that keeps you so contemporary is that you don't necessarily fight, you know what's current. So I, I think your latest no, venture, I adopt it. Yeah, and I going do. into the the food kit. Oh yes. Business. I mean, you know, like I, I would never cooking I, and entertaining. It horrifies me that people don't know how to cook anymore. But you said okay. Yeah, you know, but that's the but situation. the reason food, there are these food kits. There's two big reasons. One is the supermarkets put out so much food in the United States for you to buy. They don't know if you're going to buy steaks or chops or salad. They put out so much. 40, per, I just heard the new statistic, it's 40% of what they put out every week is thrown away because it's wasted. It's completely thrown into the garbage. That amounts to, I think, $162 billion a year of wasted food. Food kits eliminate all waste because the food kit maker, I, will know this this week what I have to send out next week. I can order uh, 10,000 chicken breasts for the 10,000 chicken dinners that were ordered. I can order the exact number of garlic cloves, everything, and they are packed up, sent out. You don't waste anything, and I don't waste anything. So it's a, and it's, we're taking on the supermarket with this food kit business. It's a very serious business, and I think it's going to really be fantastic because we can't waste stuff like this anymore. We can't waste, uh, economically, we can't do it, and we can't do it to the farmers. We can't do it to the rest of the world who's starving. So we have to pay attention. I see you have a microphone. You obviously have a question, no? Oh. Or you're handing out microphones. Oh, got it. Back um, there. There's one back yeah. here. I checked. Um, Here's one. Martha, you were talking earlier about um, the longevity of your employees, and uh, about six months ago, I had dinner with Lucinda. Um, who with, with Lucinda, who's been, yeah, a long yeah. time. She's a brilliant woman, and she, you know, talked about how long she was with you and what the culture was like in the company. Uh, can you give us your idea of what a good culture is in your organization? What that means to well, what's Lucinda uh, quit? I know. Oh, okay. I know. She quit. But she was with you for time. oh a long, long time. I knew. Time, I've known right? her since she was 16 years old, and right. she's you know mother of three giant men and and a husband, a wife of a husband. Um, no, um, it's it's um, right at, at this at this con at this Can Lion. You don't know how many people have come up to me who have worked for me, uh, so many. And with Fint, and I said, "What are you doing now?" And their jobs are so fabulous. And I have, I have helped. Oh, there's one right there's here. There's one right there. There's Kelly one right Jenner. there. They're all over the place. One right here. <laughs> I think I take my cue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you look better than you've ever looked. How come? <laughs> you know, you look fantastic. She lives in LA now, and she's a, she's just doing amazingly well as COO now. Um, I was so sorry when she left. I had even given her a pair of Ralph Lauren boots, beautiful <laughs> boots. And I wanted to. I was so mad at you. I wanted my boots back. And uh, and here she is, uh, thriving and doing very well. And I, I, it just makes me really happy. One thing I'll tell you is, you come out be smarter, so much smarter than you went here, in. Here, no. Oh, okay. Say it out loud. You come out smarter than you went in. I mean, exponentially. And yeah. there's a bunch of us who are still in this industry, and we talk about that. All and the if time. that happens, that that makes me happy. And uh, you know, I oh, I always hate to lose a good one, but they can always come back, and they do. Some of them have come back, and uh, the door is always open. And I always say that, and um, and it's and only to the ones I want to come back, not the ones I want. Um, but uh, <laughs> but it's uh, it makes it makes a huge difference to know that I've actually made a difference in in so many lives. 
And it's true. It really is true. So that's good. So good. I saw a couple of other. Um, oh, there we go. Can we get a mic? Get it. Get a mic. <clears throat> I, I love watching how you've built your empire and just how, you know, how large and how expansive it is. Um, there was that article last week about how you're now the queen of Facebook Live video. You are so quick to adapt all the trends, but millions of people must pitch you. Like, how do you decide where you're going to extend the brand and, you know, what, what goes into those considerations when you're adopting something new? Well, uh, Facebook actually did come to us with the idea of being a beta tester for them for Facebook Live. Um, and it has, it's just an amazing opportunity uh, to uh, do a real live broadcast um, and with high quality, even though it's shot on an uh, iPhone 6 Plus with two little lights or whatever. You can you can light as much as you want, but but we can do an hour television program. I just did one with Seth Meyer. I did one with uh, Jesse Tyler, um, what's his last name? Ferguson. Um, uh, and, you know, teaching Jesse how to make a cherry pie. And uh, there's your cherry pie again, Charlotte. And, uh, and oh, no, it's a rhubarb pie, sorry, rhubarb pie. And how fabulous. And the viewership is immense, and you have absolute instantaneous correspondence with the viewer. They're sending in questions and and making comments, and and it's such a lively uh, lively conversation going on all the way around. It is, uh, you know, something to really pay attention to. You know, it, it reminds me of the time that you uh, were out at Google. And you taught uh, Larry and Sergey how to make cherry mojitos. Oh, I know. They love that. I they really wish them. that had been captured. <laughs> so we have time for one or two questions. Yes, sir. Hi, Martha. Thank you so much. This has really been valuable. Um, I'm also an entrepreneur, and I'd love to hear, um, you know, I've gone through many ups and many, many downs. and. Um, with a family and a culture that we've grown at our team, it, it, I'd love to hear how you get through your toughest moments and some of your deepest downs to get back up and rebuild. Well, you just have to believe in what you're doing, actually, and, and keep your spirits up. I, I've always said I'm an optimist, and I've always tried to live like an optimist, and that there's always another opportunity. Um, if one one does not work out, there's another opportunity awaiting. And that's the only the only thing you can do as an entrepreneur. Uh, you can't you can't just cry. And another one of my mottos is, women in business, baby, don't cry. The only thing I cry about is when I read a sad story on the front page of the New York Times, like the Donald or something like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you know, you, you can't cry. You have to buck up, right? Good one, whether you're an entrepreneur or, or not, I would say. <laughs> Great. Now, I hate to tell you this, time but up. we're out of time. You are I want truly, to go to the beach. You want to go? Yeah. Let's go. Um, you are truly a legend, and uh, we're so happy well, that you're with I'm very with proud us of today. what you're doing, too, Linda. <laughs> and it's uh, amazing. Linda just keeps, keeps uh, talking about re not reinventing, but just uh, expanding a universe. You have done an amazing job, too, and, and uh, building and building and building. It's just uh, incredible. Thank you I remember so much. The day guess, Susan, guess, Susan yeah, guess where I know introduced it. me to you. Do you remember? Yes. Long Jim Dunning, her ago. husband, introduced me to you. That's right. Yep. That is right. Well, that's great. Well, you are you are an extraordinary inspiration to millions and millions of people um, and pets around the world. Thank and you. we so appreciate your taking the time. I'm to incubating be here today. turkeys right now in my kitchen. I have, an, <laughs> I have an incubator, and no, three are born while I'm away. Three baby turkeys. <laughs> It's so great. I it's love so it. Great. I love it. Well, thanks to all of you for joining us again. Have a wonderful time.